Hello and welcome. This is the CircuitPython Weekly for February 13th, 2023. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. My name is Scott and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. If you don't know, CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, considering, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday, like it does next week. Um, in the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about up upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the at CircuitPythonistas Discord role. And as I just mentioned, uh, heads up, next week is on Tuesday due to President's Day holiday here in the U.S. next Monday. And I added a note to say that at the end of the meeting as well. Um, there is a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use, use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. This meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes, so this gives you the option to skip around. After each meeting, we post a link for the next week's next meeting's notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes stock so that you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python on microcontrollers newsletter. The second is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project, and it's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. The third part is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is Status Updates. Status Updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to. Take a couple minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. Lastly, the fifth part is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These discussions can come out as status updates or be something you've ident identified ahead of time. That's too long for status updates. And that's how the meeting will go. And with that, I will start reading with the community news. So community news is a preview of the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, um, and we have a few topics. Um, first, the Raspberry Pi Pico software development kit version 1.5.0 was released. It's the official C++ uh, software developer kit. Um, and while there have been many, many fixes and enhancements, the standout is Bluetooth support uh, and specifically BLE support, not classic Bluetooth as far as I know, uh, for the Raspberry Pi Pico W. Per Tom's hardware, uh, with Bluetooth support, the Pico W can be used to create a wireless mouse, wireless keyboard, or other peripheral. Bluetooth audio does not appear to be supported. So you can just imagine creating your own DIY mouse jiggler, but operating over USB instead of uh, operating over Bluetooth instead of USB. The CircuitPython development team states this will allow CircuitPython to add support for the Pico W Bluetooth, but no estimate when this may happen. At the moment, MicroPython does not support Bluetooth for the PKW, but it was also likely in the future and likely before we do as well in CircuitPython. Um, next up, Tulip is a complete computer running MicroPython. The Tulip Creative Computer, aka Tulip CC, is a self contained portable creative computer with a display and a keyboard and sound. It boots instantaneously into a MicroPython prompt. Tulip is not a shell on top of another operating system. The entire system is dedicated to code, the display, and sound running in real time on specialized hardware. Uh, you can build your own Tulip CC for about $25 plus the cost of a display, about $50, and USB keyboard. The hardware for running Revision 4 of Tulip CC is based on the ESP32 S3 dual core microcontroller running at 240 MHz. The single inexpensive chip can, tell, can support all of Tulip's functionality at low power use. 
It can last on any USB battery pack or LiPo battery for many hours. The display we use is a 10.1-1024 by 600 RGB dot clock color LCD with capacitive touch support. Uh, Tulip's sound system is a full-featured 32 voice synthesizer with a stereo line-out slash headphone jack, and you can use speakers or other connectors instead. Um, next up, more in hardware land, is KiCad uh, 7.0 was released. The KiCad project is proud to announce the release of version 7.0. It's a significant upgrade from KiCad 6 and comes with a number of exciting new features as well as improvements to existing features. Uh, there's more on the Adafruit blog and also on the KiCad blog. And then also in KiCad news, the KiCad to Unicode renderer takes KiCad source files and translates them to Unicode text drawings, which is interesting. Um, next up, Embedded FM interviews Adafruit's Liz Clark, also known as Blitz City DIY. Um, in the latest episode, number 442, Alicia and Christopher White interview Liz Clark, who's on the CircuitPython team at Adafruit on, I do, and I do like musical robots. Uh, I guess that's the title. Liz speaks on MIDI, music, and tutorials, uh, with a link there to both the podcast and the transcript. And then last up for community news, uh, MicroPython talks from Fostem have been posted. Uh, two talks relating to MicroPython have been posted to the web. Um, Werder von Ugen, maybe, presented an introduction to MicroPython. I'm sorry. I'm, so, I'm sure I messed that name up. Uh, and then Matt Booth presented real-time 3D graphics on a MicroPython ESP32 uh, hack by hacking the EMF Camp conference badge. Uh, so check those out. They're linked in the chat. Thank you to Foamy Guy for putting them there. Um, Finally, uh, this has just been a preview of uh, the CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter. It's a, it's a newsletter, it's a community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday morning. Um, the complete archives are at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, please edit uh, next week's draft uh, on GitHub, uh, github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython dash weekly dash newsletter and, su or, and submit a pull request with changes. You may also tag a tweet with circuit, hashtag circuitpython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. Um, and Anne points out in the chat, you can also subscribe to the newsletter at adafruitdaily.com. All right, moving right along. Uh, the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. Um, this is a statistical overview of the health of the kind of the sub-projects of CircuitPython world, <laughs> if you will. Uh, first up, some overall stats. Um, overall, in the last week-ish, we had 20 uh, pull requests merged from 11 different authors. So thank you to our authors. Some new names that I uh, don't recognize are TLU, TLU, W. Gruneveld, um, and any other folks that look a bit familiar to me. So thank you to all of our authors. And we had eight reviewers for those 20 pull requests. So thank you to all of our reviewers. Uh, issues wise, overall, we had 14 closed issues by nine people and 18 opened by 16 people. So we're net up a little bit, uh, but nothing too concerning. And that's the overview. I'll roll right into the core stats. Oh, press the wrong button. Uh, for the core, we had five pull requests merged from three different authors. Uh, G. Nivarov is one of the newer authors. So thank you to them. Uh, Neradoc as well. Uh, we had three reviewers, Microdev, myself, and Dan. We had 32 open pull requests. A number of them are new, and a number of them are graphs as well. It's a bit high. I generally like to keep it in under a page of pull requests, but I think we'll get there. Um, we had six closed issues by five people and nine opened by nine people, so we are net up a few. Uh, I think generally this is due to 8.0 being released and more people trying it, which has been awesome. Uh, we have a total of 616 issues. Uh, the most urgent milestone we have, we, we kind of prioritize Adafruit-funded work 
via these milestones. Uh, we have two open issues on 8.0x, which is going to be a, a release, and I think Dan will mention that pretty soon. We have eight issues for 8.1, which is like the next feature release. And then a number of things, uh, on 57 open issues for 8xx, which are like other bugs that we'd like to fix, but not particularly urgent uh, within the 8.0 timeframe. Uh, and we have three issues not assigned to milestones, so those will need to be triaged if they haven't been already. So those are, uh, that's info for the core. Next up, I'll take a time code and read for the libraries. Katni was unable to make it. Um, so for the libraries, uh, the libraries overall, uh, this is pretty much anything with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore in the name, um, along with the bundles. Uh, had 13 pull requests merged from eight different authors, so thank you to all of our authors. We had five reviewers, um, so thank you to reviewers as well. Uh, there were a number of merged pull requests and there are 44 open. Um, the oldest is at 867 days old, quite a lot. Uh, but there's a lot going on. <laughs> uh, issues wise for the libraries, uh, seven closed issues by five people and six open by six people. So net down one, which is awesome for a total of 596 open issues, which is pretty amazing given like it's 300 plus libraries, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, 76 of those issues are good first issues, so if you want to get started contributing by, by uh, editing stuff, that's a great way. Um, library PyPI weekly download stats, uh, a total of um, 129,793 PyPI downloads over 306 libraries. Uh, the top three that I'll read off are bus device requests and register, which are not surprising given that a lot of things use them. Um, bus device in particular has 18,000 and requests is about that as well. Um, library updates in the last seven days. We had a new library for the U-Box plot from J Posada 2020 and uh, the motor, Blueford Connect, and HTTP ser server libraries were updated as well. And that is it for the libraries. I will s kick it over to Melissa for up an update on Blinka. If Melissa's around. I see you unmuted, but I do not hear you. Can anybody else hear Melissa? I can, I'll read it off. Just a moment, Melissa says. Okay, I, I think I will just read it off here. Oh, okay. thank you. Melissa says go ahead and read it. Okay, so for Blinka stats, uh, there were two pull requests merged from two different authors um, and also two reviewers. Uh, there are five open pull requests, and this is across uh, Blinka, Blinka BLEIO, uh, Blinka, or Platform Detect and PureIO, so not just in the Blinka repository, kind of the Blinka universe. So if you don't know, Blinka is the uh, compatibility layer that presents the CircuitPython API on single board computers so that all of the libraries in CircuitPython uh, can be used on single board computers within Linux. Um, there was one closed issues by one person and three open by two people for a total of 91 open issues on the Adafruit Blinka repo. Uh, Blinka had 25,297 PI downloads in the last week along with uh, 8,479 8, in Pi Wheels. Uh, the number of supported boards is now uh, 101. And that's it for the state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinka. Next up, we have Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance for us to say thank you to folks within the community. Um, and uh, generally reinforce uh, and thank reinforce what we value as a community, but also just give people the credit where credit is due. 
So uh, first up, I will start, and then this is a round robin, so we'll go down the list uh, here. So you start start to hear some other voices, which will be fun. Okay, for myself, um, hug reports to Lady Ada Carter, retired wizard Naradoc, and Jay Posada 2020 for testing Pi Sigrock. Um, hug report to Dan H for the 8.0 release and managing 8.x. It's neat to see new faces trying 8.0. Um, the KiCad team for 7.0, I'm excited to try it. I'm always amazed at how much better KiCad is the next time I use it. And a hug report to Naradoc for the I2C display pin in use fix. Next up, we have notes from C. Grover, who says, a hug report to Jose David, uh, aka J. Posada 202020, for submitting a superb example for the color fader helper in the community bundle. Hug report to Mark, aka Gambler, for the work on animated GIFs and the potential for display I.O. performance improvements. Hug report to Foamy Guy and John Park for being willing and enthusiastic to stream live. Uh, always something new to discover and apply. To OK Yuron OK for suggesting a rudeness eliminator circuit design for pesky TRS MIDI inputs. No more wondering if that input cable is wired for type A or type B polarity. Um, hug report to Tectric for the help with the CI for my 19 community bundle repos. They submitted an individual pull request for each repo to update and improve the CI, certainly above and beyond. Lastly, a hug report to Dan H and the team plus community for the 8.0 release. Thank you, C. Grover. Next up is Dan. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, thanks to Gene Everoff for continuing async IO discussions and work as a PR a draft PR that has a lot of interesting stuff in it. And uh, Gene Everoff also uh, has made at least one PR fix, I think two actually to the core. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Naradoc for two uh, very helpful core fixes. Thanks to uh, Jeff also for two quick fixes to the core. And thanks to you, Scott, for the Pi Sig Rock work, which I think leapfrogged some uh, stalled work elsewhere. Thank you very much, and it's interesting to a lot of people. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up, I have from notes from David Gloud, who's uh, oh, time code, time code, time code. Um, says group hug to everyone behind the 8.0 release. Uh, uh, yeah, that's from David. And next up, we have DJ Devin three. Ooh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a hug for Silly World and for you, Scott Tanute, for sending me down a rabbit hole last week uh, about the diode matrix and multiplexers uh, for a PCB design. Uh, so th thank you both for your helpful advice in, in last week's meeting. To a hug to Mark Gambler and Foamy Guy for teaming up to work on animated GIF support. It's been a real treat to watch the progress unfold on uh, Foamy Guy's stream. And the conversations that those two have back and forth is, is really cool to, to watch. Uh, most of that's over my head, but it's really cool to watch. <laughs> um, a hug to Liz Clark for the awesome Octoprint guide. The way that No showed it working on 3D Hangouts was extremely impressive, and I can't wait to dive into Octoprint and MQTT stuff uh, using her guide. Uh, a hug to Toddbot for a nice conversation this week. Your guidance is very appreciated, and I have a better sense of direction with my future PCB designs. Uh, and that also ties into the diode matrix stuff. Um, and a hug to C the CircuitPython developers for an 8.0 release, and Scott for hosting the meeting. Thank you, DJ Devin3. Next up is Foamy Guy. All right, uh, let's see. Hug report this week. Uh, thank you to uh, Tectric for continually making improvements to the CI and surrounding infrastructure, as well as helping out uh, folks in the community to reap the benefits from those improvements in their own libraries. Uh, thank you to uh, Mark Gambler for working on the GIF support. Had a chance to play with that uh, this week, and that's definitely coming along nicely. Um, and then uh, lastly for me, thanks to you, Scott, for working on the... Bengal JS device, as well as um, I think I saw you mention some stuff about the multicolor e ink a couple of weeks back as well. Both of those are on my radar to start playing with soon. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Thanks, Fumi Guy. All right. And uh, next up is Jeff. 
Hello. I uh, need to thank Liz for help already with the download page items and fritzing part for an upcoming guide and who I'm about to ask for help again with organizing the OV5640 product guide. Uh, <clears throat> as a couple of you already said, thanks to Gene Evero for a video chat last week. I'm really excited about their motivation to improve async. And to GitHub user uh, GelSource, I'm guessing at the pronunciation here, for an issue report against the core with all the info that I needed to resolve the issue. And that's what I got. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, next up, we have notes from Jose David. After I take a typo. First, a hug report to Tanute for the work on PySigRock. Hug report to Mark for adding the GIF support. And a hug to Toddbot for path to point class for rendering SVG points in CircuitPython. And with this principle, creating a pi a pie chart. Ooh, that sounds cool. I haven't seen that. Next up, we have notes from Katni. Katni says, hug report to Blitz City DIY for helping out with the Arduino bits and a guide I'm writing and one I updated. The other host of this meeting for covering for me for a few months when I needed it. A hug report to Toddbot for helping me figure out amp to volt math for help sorting out how many LEDs I need for a specific project and the hilarity that ensued. Hug report to Ann B for always being flexible about my weekly newsletter contributions. Hug report to Tectric for a lovely chat asking to discuss adding issue templates to the libraries and taking that task on. Um, forgot Folks I forgot because my memory isn't great lately and a group hug. Next up is Melissa. Hi, uh, can you hear me this time? Yes. Okay, I'm uh, just using my built-in mic on my computer. Sounds good. Um, I just wanted to give a group hug today. Sounds good. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, next up, we have notes from Mark, who says, uh, Hug report to Foamy Guy for finding an alignment bug in the GIF support and testing the PR out. And a hug to Jepler for the tile grid optimization PR that was eventually closed. Filled in some knowledge gaps I had. Next up is Microdev. Uh, I have a group up for the entire community. Awesome. Thank you, Markadev. And next up, I have two more text onlys to round out hug reports. First, we have Tectric, who says hug report to Dan H., Maker Melissa, Tan Newt, Jepler, and Microdev for feedback on recent PRs. Hug to Katni for a good discussion regarding bug report templates for the libraries and a group hug. Last up, we have a note from Toddbot, who says, Hug report to Katni for convincing me to attend the weekly CircuitPython meeting. And next up, uh, that's it for Hug reports. Next up, we have another round robin that is uh, status updates. Status updates uh, is a lot the same, but this time it's about what you've been working on and what you plan on working on in the coming week. Um, it's a great way to figure out who's doing work related to work that you've done before or um, collaborating uh, for those sorts of things. So I will start and we'll go through the, the list as uh, written in the note stock. So let me put it, take another time code and say I'm wrapping up the PySig rock work for the moment. Um, I added analog support. I added support for skipped digital channels, which will still slow down the capture rate, though. So it'll capture between the start and end channel, but it will at least mask in their immediate channels. I reworked the data output so it can include raw logic waveforms, but also decoder output, which is pretty cool. And I'm not sure most of <laughs> SIGROC does this, so that's pretty neat. I added VCD output support, which is useful for using GTK Wave, GTK wave for viewing uh, capture and decoder output. I also added WaveDrum support, uh, which uh, is a like JavaScript to SVG sort of renderer that's really pretty nice. Uh, so I added support for that. Um, and there's additional work that could be do done to make it uh, prettier. Uh, like syncing the diagram to a clock signal would make it much more compact. Um, but that's pretty neat. And I, I'm i trying to wrap it up, and I'm getting to the point where I can use it, and other folks can use it, and we can kind of iterate from there. 
Um, I need to take a renewed look at the Bengal JS2 PR and get it building for everything. I had gotten, I was trying to build all of the NRF boards with the particular DFU support that is needed for Bengal JS2, but I, I need to change that. It's just uh, not easy to do on Windows. And so, yeah, I need to just spend a couple hours working on that. And then uh, I'll be picking up the IMX RT 1011. I have a, a prototype Metro here, and uh, I'll be kind of verifying the status of the port. Um, this is kind of a push for us to make it uh, stable in our mind um, because we will be releasing some products with it. Um, so that's next on my list, um, and that's my status update. So next up, we have um, notes from C. Grover that I'll read off. C. Grover says, after nine fully refactored revisions, the Precision VCO PCB is off at Osh Park and Osh Stencils. I guess it'll be safe to upgrade the KiCad 7.0 now. The AD5293 10-bit digital potentiometer used in the VCO module added two more Eurorack module designs to the list, a dual ADSR with presets and a Vactrol simulator with neon LED incandescent and custom response curves. Unrelated observation, the leaf blower slash vacuum mulching impellers don't last forever and can fail with gusto. Ooh, I feel like there's a video related to that. Uh, next up, we have Dan. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, I've been doing some work, not strictly Circuit Python, on the Sambi 21. You have to bootloader. A uh, user was having trouble, and it seemed like it was not updating the boot protection properly. Uh, it turns out that the uh, bootloader updater takes eight seconds to do its work for no particularly good reason, and the user wasn't waiting long enough for that. So um, hmm. we will shorten that. <laughs> also, the same user, the reason they same user was also interested in having brownout protect protection on the Sami 21 because when uh, the power jiggles a lot, um, it can cause the internal flash to get erased. We already saw that problem on Sami 51, and it's harder to happen, but it does also happen on the Sami 21. So that's another fix I'll be making to the bootloader. And I will uh, hand that off to the user to test. Um, the main thing that I've been working on for the past several days is safemode.py. This is a, a file that will be run. Normally when you go into safe mode, nothing gets run. And you, if you go into the REPL, it'll tell you why you're in safe mode because of some error or because you deliberately got into safe mode. Um, but there are a number of problems with that, like an unattended board can't be reset if it goes into safe mode, for instance. So uh, we decided a long time ago to add safemode.py, which would run kind of like boot.py before anything else happens. And it could decide to do something based on the safe mode. So like it could just do a reset and clear the safe mode. And we've seen since we've seen um, hard crashes from various Wi-Fi problems and also from batteries running down, this seems uh, interesting to people right now. So uh, this will there'll be a PR for this quite soon. Um, there's not a lot you can do in safe mode that Pi except reset or not. If you don't reset, then you'll just fall into the regular safe mode handling. Um, you can't sleep there or anything, but that's okay. Uh, because you can always sleep in code.py. And so you'll see this feature probably in 8.1 or something like that, I would guess. Mm -hmm. All right. And now, uh, and finally, um, as mentioned, we'll probably do a CircuitPython 801 soon um, with some minor fixes. The most interesting fix is one that makes the Scorpio uh, work properly. It was driving the LED pins too fast or too hard with higher current and it can cause the board to just, uh, things to go bad like resets and stuff. So mm -hmm. that's an important fix to go in. So I, I think I'll do that this week sometime. Okay. Thanks, Dan. All right, next up, I have notes from David, who says, uh, previously, I tested PyLeap from Android. Does the Circuit Playground Bluefruit and the Clue? Where where do I report 
issues slash ideas. And the answer to that is if you look, if you search in the Adafruit repos, you'll, you can search for PyLeap and there you'll find PyLeap for Android. Um, so the PyLeap for Android uh, GitHub repo is the place to file issues. Um, David says, upgrading 10 plus boards and feathers to 8.0, including the libraries. Updated the mouse jiggler with a macro pad. Um, there's a gist here with a special feature, stealth mode, only visible as a mouse. Octagonal edge size is Octagonal edge size is controlled by the rotary encoder. Can even change the rotating direction by going negative. Uh, Non-circuit Python. I recovered my son, son a previous gamer PC, the RTX 2060, to try installing Ubuntu and NVIDIA driver, stable diffusion in UI or web interface. I failed at the net NVIDIA driver, so I will start, restart from scrap. Restart from scratch. Next up is DJ Devon three. Thank you. I am excitedly waiting on the arrival of a Raspberry Pi 4 so I can start my Octoprint and MQTT journey using Liz Clark's guide. Uh, I started designing an enclosure for an old 720p Logitech C510 webcam, uh, which I took apart and lost the housing more than a decade ago. <laughs> the first prototype, Snap, fit together so well I had to use a razor blade to separate it. Live and learn. The second prototype now has a slot for a screwdriver to easily pry the halves apart. So if you guys have ever designed anything with snap fit, sometimes they snap together too well. Um, and that's something that I haven't seen uh, in any of Noah's videos about snap fit parts is designing in something to actually separate the two halves. So I designed something that you can just stick a little screwdriver in and pry apart. Um, I added the qu a quarter inch 20 threaded standard camera screw mount uh, to that, which the original never had. It's one of those old, you know, laptop kind of grippy webcam things. So now I can repurpose that old webcam for an Octoprint, uh, for Octoprint and mount that to the 3D printer. Uh, finished printing a nice di dichromatic blue green enclosure for Foamy Guy's TR Cowbell. Uh, I got inspired because I was looking for PLAs, and the name of the the name of the PLA color is Seafoam, which <laughs> immediately just reminded me of Foamy Guy. So I really appreciate his efforts on the project. So I wanted to ensure that he receives a, a nice enclosure for his efforts, and I will be shipping that out sometime this week, hopefully. Uh, I discussed with Foamy Guy, and neither of us have seen any evidence of errant behavior from the MCP two three zero one seven chips used by the TR Cowbell in are in many other projects, including many other Adafruit projects and learn guides and stuff. So it does affect um, Adafruit in, in some way. Uh, and those those issues that Microskip, uh, Microchip described in their recent product notification, we haven't seen any evidence that, that it actually exists with the chips that I've been shipping out anyway. So um, that that's, I don't know, that one's really confused me. Uh, but because the TR Cowbell uses all eight inputs per chip. I cannot take the chance with future designs, and I already started redesigning it with a diode matrix, which eliminates one of the multiplexers, and I'm looking at a, another avenue for eliminating the second multiplexer. If any TR Cowbell version 1.2 owners experience any issues with failed step switch reads requiring you to pe press a switch multiple times for the, the switch to read, because that would be in line with what Microchip says the behavior should be, uh, for a, a faulty chip, then please contact me because I would like to, to know and be able to track these issues and see how well they're actually working out in the wild. And <laughs> that's it for me. Thank you, DJ Devon 3 Next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, thanks, Scott. Last week I was working on some argument validation inside of a couple of the display I.O. classes in the core. Um, I... Uh, we have a PR in for that. It was failing to actions, um, but I think it just failed to download something. I restarted that a while ago. I need to check in on that later on today as well. Um, I also tried out uh, the early version of the GIF support in Display.io uh, last week on a couple of different devices. And then the, uh, the other main thing I was working on last week was a couple of different library PR tests uh, around the .star library, HTTP server, and a couple other small ones. Um, for this week, I've been doing uh, some more library PR testing. Um, this week, I've been working on Ethernet 
uh, display a layout, and then I have uh, mini MQTT and a couple others lined up to look into this afternoon. Um, I will. I saw there was some updates in the GIF support PR, so I'll circle back and test the latest version of that. And then uh, the other thing I want to look into this week is the multicolor uh, e-ink support, the like seven color. I picked up one of the Pimeroni um, screens with multiple e-ink colors in it, so I'm interested to play around with that a bit. Um, and that's what I got. Thanks. Nice. Let me know if you have questions about that. It's stuck in the Bengal JS2 PR. <laughs> Um, okay, next up is Jeff. Hello. Uh, so last week, I fixed an obscure crashing bug in CircuitPython 8. Uh, that was the bug with the really excellent bug report, and it was a, an aspect of chained exceptions that I hadn't fully thought through. Uh, but I believe that's fixed now. And I also incorporated Philby's fix for Scorpio USB flakiness in CircuitPython. And I've been working on a product guide for the OB5640 breakout. This week, uh, I had wrote that I would be finishing it. Um, that's turned into more of a hopefully finishing because in our internal meeting, uh, we added several more demos that the guide is going to show. Uh, some of those need to be written yet. Um, hopefully, something else fun. Uh, don't know what. And I do very much want to print Liz's Octoprint project that uh, looks super cool and useful. Uh, and that's what I got. And I'm probably going to leave the meeting right after this because I have stuff to take care of. But. I uh, hope the rest of you have a good rest of the meeting. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Let me take another time code, and I'll read off a couple. Uh, first up from Jose David. Uh, last week, small documentations improvements, working on some CircuitPython personal libraries, and uh, working on an example for the Color Fader community library. This library allows you to systematically fade your chosen color. This week, I uh, continue my community library's discovery and other small documentation improvements. And now I have notes from Katni, who says, Last week, uh, through much of the ESP32 S2 reverse TFT Feather Guide, updated the Feather ESP32 S3 Guide to reflect the change in battery monitor chip, reviewed Liz's guide, Met with Alec to get him going on GitHub issue templates on the library repos, uh, as in the core. Uh, this week, continuing reverse TFT ESP32 S2 feather guide, creating a fit fritzing object and pretty pins for reverse TFT S3 feather. Elsewhere, time lapse is still going and the plant is definitely changing. Building an LED grow light for new plants, researched it, and white dot stars and the red in the RGB dot stars are the proper spectrum and wavelength respectively for growing plants. Decided to build my own. And now time for maker Melissa. Hello. Hello. Sorry. Uh, um, no problem. See, I, uh, I was mostly focused on the CircuitPython installer. I finished up the U of 2 copy step, which sounds easy, but been making use of like the file system access API and showing copy progress. It made the step a little bit trickier. I finished working on incorporating the REPL library I made, and I'm currently working on getting the user credentials and reading, writing, and parsing the settings.toml file via the REPL working. And uh, I fixed a few bugs in the CircuitPython code editor. Awesome. I'm so excited for the installer. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, thanks. Next up, I have notes from Mark, uh, who says, uh, Animated GIF work is almost ready to leave draft status. Plan is for this week. Next up, I want to look at Display.io to see what opportunities may exist for optimizations. Uh, next up is Microdev. Okay, so let's talk CI. Uh, this is something I picked up this year and uh, have made multiple PRs in the last month. And the goal was to get the PR time down uh, under an hour. Uh, it took uh, an hour and 30 minutes. So now it takes uh, like uh, one hour and three minutes. And I think I can get it down further. Uh, so yeah. All right. And I, it looks like we'll talk in the weeds a little bit more as well. Yeah. Thank you, Microdev. All right, uh, lastly, I will read Tectrix uh, text update after I write a time code. 
Uh, Tectric says, last week started drafting issues templates for the libraries, similar to the ones in, used in the core. Uh, submitted final remaining PRs to fix the CI deprecation. Thank you again to everyone who supported this. This will make the June 1st deprecation date of Node.js 12 for actions runners much less impactful. Uh, a few PR reviews helped C. Grover update all their libraries to use the library CI composite actions since they were having issues with the CI regarding releases. Started a repository for documenting CI issues and their fixes, hoping to add information here over time, starting with recent learnings. This week, going away for the weekend, so not expecting to start anything new. And that's it for status updates. Thank you, everyone, uh, and for letting us know all the different cool things that you're working on. Uh, the last section here we have is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is a chance for us to have any longer form discussion um, about core work, library work, community work. Um, and generally, if you have topics, please drop them in here. We have a couple already, but if anybody has any other things to talk about, please uh, add them in the note stock there. The note stock is always available in the CircuitPython dev channel under the pin icon. Um, so first up, uh, we'll see if Mark is around. Yeah, I am um, right now. Uh, just quick question for the animated GIF support about which boards mm -hmm. I should make sure it's enabled on. Um, right now, if they're kind of tied together. I put it in the GIF IO module, which includes GIF Writer, which was only turned on for camera boards. Mm -hmm. So I can turn on the whole module, including on disk GIF and GIF Writer. Um, it fits on all but one M4 board, and I'm thinking that's a specific something specific on that board that which I haven't looked at it yet mm -hmm. um, by default display o doesn't go on most of the um, the small m0 boards or this so that's fine right um, yeah just making sure otherwise that's the fine settings and then I'll make sure those all get submitted I think that's fine I did see a thing I think it might have been in the bangle JS PR with the seven color e ink as well. I'm the pew pew m4 ran out of space. That's, that's the one I saw as well. Yeah, and the way that I fixed it is the SAMD 21s have some build stuff to not build terminal IO for uh, Japanese, Russian, and Korean, I want to say. Like three different uh, languages that tend to fill up. Um, the SAMD21 has a chunk of code that says just like on those ones, turn it off because our font doesn't cover a lot of the, the glyphs anyway. Um, yeah. so that's what I brought to the PPM4, which hopefully leaves enough space for both of us on it. Okay. That sounds good. Uh, I'll double check with you cause that's in the bangle. Yeah. Uh, PR still. Yeah. yeah and I, okay. I just did it just for that one board, but it's something that we could do for all M4s. Um, or good. even all boards if we wanted to because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have terminal io if all of your glyphs don't show up <laughs> or a lot of your True. glyphs don't show up um, although any errant english will still show so all right i will make sure that's in there okay. and then i think it's pretty much ready to come out of draft so all right yeah i, I have Excellent. a tab open for it so <laughs> yeah i when it comes out of draft, you can take another look at it. I think I got everything you commented on. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, Mark. All right. Next up, we have Microdev. Yeah. So I've been thinking about uh, getting the time for the CI down. And uh, for that, uh, the, ma the majority of time now taken is for the board bills and uh, I'd like to skip the translation builds. Uh, if we can do that, then the CI will be like 30 minutes, which now takes like an hour. So <laughs> my idea was to just have like a hard uh, uh, press, uh, you know, threshold level, like a 10K, like, uh, uh, let's say we compute uh, for ENUS translation, uh, a size then multiply that by 10 and just uh, go with it and just assume if the board fits that amount of uh, language, then it will be able to fit all other languages. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I've always resisted this um, because we never really know which language is not going to fit. Um, and I do like having all of the artifacts as well. Um, yeah, so regarding the artifacts, uh, another thing that uh, I would be doing was is something that, like so users can fork, uh, create a fork of Circuit Python and then they can run a AI on their forks and do a custom build. Uh, there's a uh, something like workflow dispatch event, mm -hmm. and it uh, creates a really nice graphical interface for inputting commands, and you can just hmm. make a board build that way. Interesting. That th does sound really interesting, especially in terms of the folks that want to like turn a module on that's not usually on. Yeah. yeah. Um, I still would say that like that's pretty advanced, but you know we've Dan and I and Jeff have also had discussions about like better ways of doing translations that are that don't require like the link step. Um, yeah, so. or 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 doing it, uh, doing a link that's not an LTO link for the translations. But maybe that's sort of already true. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would be. I I think I might be okay with the non-merge builds, just building English, and maybe the largest language or something like that. Like the PR builds, but not the, the like... PR builds, right? Because then you get a lot more turnaround on the. On yeah, the... only for the PR builds. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, I that seems okay to me because I don't, I don't, people don't normally test. If somebody really wanted a foreign language build, or non English build, I should say, for a PR, like to give as an artifact, it could be done by hand. That's true. And not as like through GitHub. I could just say, oh, you, you, you want to test this in French. But it's important to know which builds are going to blow out. And so I think it's necessary to test the largest builds like Russian, maybe in Japanese or something, uh, in maybe in the PR builds. Um, mm -hmm. Because otherwise, we don't see that until the merge. We wouldn't see that until the merge happens. And then there'd be a lot of cleanup. Uh, All right. So what, what do you think about that, Scott? I mean, does that feel less? Yeah, it does feel less. Like if, if we if we build them all for main, the main branch, then that gets me really what I want. Yeah, yeah. Once we do a merge, then it would build everything, right? And and that it's still true that, yes, it would be really nice to figure out a better way, a faster way to do translation so that right. it doesn't take that that long. I mean, I, I think in the long run, also, we have so many boards, and I don't know really how to cut out down the number of boards. Uh, I mean, we've done, a pre we've done a pretty good job, though, of not building every board unless we think we have to. Yes. And then yes. MicroDAS added the ability of, like, if it passed once and we don't think it'll fail again, then don't do it. So that all of my PRs also have so many changes that they always build all the boards. Yeah, yeah. My, my, right. yeah, me too. So, so yeah, I so I'm I'm interested in I'm interested in doing a small number. I'm not sure that you can guess whether the the build will blow will will be too large or not just by adding a constant factor. Mm -hmm. I but, mean, I tried estimating uh, uh, the size of translation, but uh, couldn't get any far because when you factor in the linking step and the alignment. Uh, that the linker adds, uh, then uh, it all all gets messed up. I was getting a difference of like 300 bytes, mm -hmm. but like from comparing Russian build to the U Ian English US build. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the estimation. Yeah, I don't. I think. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna say what you said is like I don't think that's very worth it, but I'm just open to building like two languages for PRs. Yeah. And that's less work for now. And you I, mean, can... I can get a PR in and see, uh, like, uh, I did a PR on my fork, but I on the fork, uh, GitHub only provides 20 runners, and on the Fruit Circuit Python repo, then it provides 16 runners. So hmm. I imagine it would be really fast. On my fork, it took 30 minutes. To only so, do English, or? 
Yeah, only English build for all the boards. So if you do like English and Russian or English and Japanese, well, you can see it might be nice to automatically decide which is the largest build, but I don't know where you would keep that, look up that data. So, um, or you'd have to go to the S3 to find it or something. I'm not sure if that's where. Or you'd have to build one board and measure them all and then down. Well, and it, it varies too because there are uh, a lot of. The linking, yeah. the linking step, uh, uh, like the linking step takes 20 seconds. And if uh, the language, uh, all the compression generation of the generation of the compression data takes like five seconds. So I think we can just uh, go ahead with only generating the compression data, not linking. And just uh, assuming based on the compression data and then adding a like uh, the threshold for that. I see what I you're saying. I, I think my bias is just to try to keep it simpler, like just do English and Russian or something. And then if we end up having the main branch break because we didn't test it beforehand, that's fine. We'll just fix it. We'll, we can fix it and then we can discuss whether that's the language we should be building instead. <laughs> So there is now uh, like uh, queuing of the merge PRs. I think uh, Scott, you only right. mentioned that. So what it will do is like uh, if you you if you are in a merge queue, then you can run your CI checks in the merge queue, and if they fail in the merge queue, then uh, they will not uh, get uh, uh, right merged into main. So that way we can avoid getting that's the main idea. Yeah, yeah that, that's an interesting idea. Mm. I didn't realize it could be used for that purpose. Yeah, that's a good point. Like that merge queue would build all the languages, like as a final check. Right, and but it would right, but we wouldn't have broken builds. Right, that's very interesting. So yeah, so I would say go ahead with something and maybe do something easy to start with, yeah. and then we'll see how much it improves. Um, Okay. Yeah. So, Thank you for spending time on this. I mean, especially what you've done so far, it's been incremental, but it's, it's you know. Uh, so the thing is, like, even if you get uh, the depend, like, installing a depend dependency takes one minute and you get it down, like, to 10 seconds. The thing is, uh, when you factor in the par parallelism of the boards, uh, you are dividing, like, really dividing number of jobs, uh, number of boards built by number of continuous parallelism so let's say if you are building 70 boards and dividing that by 60 only get like six times whatever improvement you are making yeah so it is six times 10 seconds that's only one minute so it's only like the amount of work required to get this far compared to the increase it's not very like issue yeah nice. But it means they all complete faster so that you can go on to the next 60 faster. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. And it reflects when you have less runners, so then the time decreases quite a bit. Right. I mean, I'm very grateful to GitHub for running this for free. You know, if, if we didn't, if it weren't free, it would probably cost us Hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars a year in, yeah. in, in 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 GitHub Actions costs. So we're very I'm very grateful for what they do already. But thank you very much for spending the time on this. I really appreciate it. Sure. All right, and with that, I'm going to wrap our meeting up. Another thing, another thing yep. I've mentioned in the weeds. Okay. Yeah. So I brought this up with Scott uh, a few weeks earlier. It's regarding defoking circuit Python. So mm. the motivation here is that uh, the like uh, like collaborations for GitHub doesn't uh, you know really <clears throat> get the collaborators recognizes the, the contributions made to a fork. Basically, folks are really meant as special repositories used to peer upstream, and all the GitHub tools are built around that fact. So instead of counting contributions, the folks they think it would be eventually get merged upstream, then they'll count it. But it doesn't happen for us. So that only I wanted to. Where does that? Where... If there is interest. 
where are where are you looking for a contribution activity is that like uh, on your like user page so like okay so on the profile page uh, the contributions on the profile page so like issue interactions and uh, but uh, so the commit uh, they are not recognized and and eventually like it's okay that's you can you can ignore it at that but uh, like when you get to uh, set up a sponsorship page uh, for text like uh, getting sponsors then it mentions uh, it doesn't list circuit python as a repo in which you are contributing interesting I see and what, uh, I like see what also saying. the things like uh, I think you mentioned that uh, it uh, in a, search has now been enabled for for the folks. Mm -hmm. but I didn't quite uh, I didn't quite was I don't I want wasn't able to get it uh, working. Search thing. Yeah, I realized after we talked that it was I was seeing it because it was under feature preview. Um, I mean, you have to type in some special keywords, poke equal to true, and then I don't know, like, mm. and quite get it to work. I use cs.github.com, but that's a that was a private beta. But they mo they they've moved that into regular search now. So if you're just, at least yeah. for me, if you're just viewing code and then go up into the search bar, it'll search the the current repo. Yeah. It seems to do the right. And it does the fork now. It used to give you an error that said, this is not available on forks. Yeah. But... I mean, yeah, the, the advantage is to remaining part of MicroPython. I, I think I mean, you probably discussed this with Scott, but it makes the merges a lot easier. It makes it, it politically, I think it's better, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's another uh, reason. I right. didn't quite, uh, wasn't sure to bring this up. Like when, when you get into this, the people start comparing MicroPython and CircuitPython, then they start saying like one is better over this and that. And we, we have talked to the MicroPython yes, yes, people about factoring out the language core as a separate repo. That's a long-term project, but that may never happen, but it's it it also means I mean, as I see it, like uh, I don't think we get, uh, I I don't think we get uh, anything from being a fork, right? Uh, like the merges will still be merges. Uh, fork has nothing to do with that. But we do, but we do get labeled that way, and I think it is important that just on GitHub we're marked as a fork. Yeah, I I, I think that's okay, right? Um, I would wonder I'm, I'm looking up at actually, let me copy this link there's a link here of like what contributions count um, it's a bunch of stuff so any interactions basically any commit messages or uh, I have seen only pull requests and uh, review activity counted right this is it must be the right email address. It must be a standalone repository, not a fork. Yeah. And the commits were made in the repository's default branch or GH pages. I mean, I think we could lobby GitHub to change that policy. I'm wondering where. <laughs> I'm sure somebody's already done that. Yeah. I mean, that's the fundamental issue, right? So folks are only built to, you know, make a contributions upstream. So mm -hmm. That's why they don't uh, think that it will be beneficial to count the contributions made to a fork. Because eventually they'll count the contributions uh, which were which will eventually be up upstream. So why count it twice? Right. Technically, I mean. Right. So we can contact get su GitHub support and detach it. Yeah. I mean, th there is a. Uh, whole process for it. Uh, basically, it says if your project gets too big, then <laughs> you may might want to. Yeah, I think. I, I and and we talked about this a little bit before, but I think if if you want it for yourself, I think there are other things we could do. Like, if I think if we look at contributions on Adafruit Circuit Python, like it should show you there. So. 
even though it's not showing on that profile page, you could make a readme for you that says like lots of my contributions are in this thing that's a fork. Here's a way to see that um, instead. I mean, it would be quite... great one word official. Like you're number 10 <laughs> on my contributors. I don't know. I haven't checked what part of it. Which is pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, I think... I don't know. I I think it's important that we that we still own that we're fork, a fork of MicroPython. Yeah, like, I, I, I don't mean to downplay like any MicroPython stuff. Obviously, we, still, we will still keep doing merges and we'll still support MicroPython and all right. that. And we, I think we should, st even if uh, we were deattached, we should still mention that uh, it's a fork project. Right. But, uh, like if you if you defork from MicroPython, then I on the like on the home page of the repo, there are only like, right. mentions like only at a single place. Right. Regarding the fork, but uh, you can still mention it in the description and have a whole flowchart and like what comes from where. Right. That way, so that's true. Uh, any other folks have thoughts? All right, I think I don't know, I don't know what we should do. <laughs> We can keep thinking about it. We can also um, talk to Phil and Lamar internally about it and get their opinion. Um, see what they think. And and we could, before we do it officially, we could also talk with Damien and, and Jim about it too, just so that they yeah. have background. Um, if we do choose to do it, they're not surprised by it. And they'll understand why. Okay, I'm going to wrap us up because we're over time. Um, there actually has been... we. I did talk somewhat about moving the CircuitPython repo to the CircuitPython org as well, um, but that could be a separate thing. Um, okay, I'm going to wrap us up. Thank you, MicroDev, for bringing that stuff up. Uh, okay, so for... Uh, let me switch back to the script. For the wrap up. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly for February 13th, 2023. Thank you everybody who participated. Uh, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us that are that work on CircuitPython for Adafruit, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. Uh, it will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. Uh, the next meeting is held on Tuesday, so 24 hours later than normal. It is the 21st of February. Uh, there's a U.S. holiday next Monday, so that's why. Um, this meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the Circuit Pythonesis role on Discord. And with that, we hope to see you all next week. Thank you all. Have a great week. <laughs>